All right, it is noon, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds here at the University of Colorado. It is, again, good to be back in person this year, and so we are going to be primarily holding this conference in person. Once again, the room is probably about three quarters full, and we're uh, happy to welcome a few more people here, but we will keep the Zoom link open for the entire year uh, for those who can't make it in person. But if you can, we're in Research Complex 2 on the second floor in the Krugman Conference Room. Uh, just a note, upcoming talks on September 14th next week is Dr. John Messenger discussing transcatheter interventions for valvular heart disease. And then on September 21st, we're gonna have our first systems improvement conference of the year run by our quality and safety experts. And that will be an all virtual conference. So four times this year, we will not be in person. I will remind folks not to come here on the 21st. Uh, just as a reminder, you can use the QR code up here to get CME and MOC credit for all medical grand rounds this year. And questions will come primarily from our live audience, but our chief medical residents are here. They will be uh, watching the Zoom Q&A feature. And so if you have questions and you are remote uh, for Dr. Davis, please put them in the Zoom Q&A. We'll save them till the end of the talk and make sure we get to them as part of our conversation. Uh, and now I really am pleased to welcome Dr. Sean Davis uh, to Medical Grand Rounds. He is a professor of medicine and the Rifkin Chair uh, of, the can of Cancer Informatics here at the University of Colorado. He's also the deputy director of the Center for Health Artificial Intelligence and a senior instructor at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. He did his undergrad work at Princeton University. He went to medical school at the University of Pittsburgh, during which time he also earned his PhD in human genetics. He was a resident in pediatrics at the University of Washington and then did his fellowship in hematology oncology at the combined John Hop Johns Hopkins and National Cancer Center Institute Program for Research, followed by research fellowships at the NCI as well as the National Human Genome Research Institute. Following his training, he was a member of the National Cancer Institute for 13 years before we were fortunate enough to recruit him here to Colorado in 2020, presumably wanted a bigger change in 2020. Uh, he has held a large number of leaderships for leadership positions, truly too many to name, uh, regarding cancer, artificial intelligence, and the use of genetic data, including being a member of the 2016 Presidential Subcommittee on AI and Machine Learning as part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. His work has led to over 100 original publications on genetics, cancer, and related topics. He is currently supported in his work with a UO1 titled Exploiting Public Metagenomic Data to Uncover Cancer Microbiome Relationships, an R25 focused on big data training for cancer research, and several large private and industry grants. Uh, it really is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Davis to Medical Grand Rounds. All right, I'll put this up for a, a minute, but um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the, the, um, the kind uh, um, invitation. Um, I got here, uh, I was hired, I guess, in uh, uh, last year, a year and a half ago. Uh, I arrived in Colorado five months later, as was pointed out. Um, yes, we, need, we wanted more change in our lives. Uh, so um, we, we, we chose to move across the country with our cat. Um, I'm a cat person. My cat has an Instagram. Anybody who wants to know, come up afterwards. I'll give it to you. Um, so we want to talk a little bit today uh, about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the idea here is really not to give um, uh, a um, traditional medical grand rounds. So I'm not going to give an overview of all the uses of artificial intelligence and machine learning in medicine. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to ask you, uh, rather than to think about a patient that I'm going to present, think about a patient or a problem that you've seen in your medical practice or in your, your rounds or whatever, um, who you thought maybe flashed through your mind, man, wouldn't it be cool if I had a computer that would help me make a decision about this? Um, that said, there are very few uh, applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning in clinical practice. So take that idea, hold on to it, but recognize that it might be a very long time before that computer exists. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a more nitty gritty kind of um, uh, approach to artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm basically going to try to give you um, a few of the buzzwords, um, a little bit of an intuition about how some of the, the algorithms work, um, some of the, the, um, uh, the problems with applying them, and then we'll talk just a teeny bit at the end about bias and ethics in, in artificial intelligence. Again, I have 40 minutes, uh, actually 35 now. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to cover all this in detail in, or in depth. That said, as we're going through, um, I'm totally open to people asking questions. 
the whole goal here is for you guys to learn. Um, so if you have questions, uh, somebody else probably has the same question, feel free. I don't have to get through all the slides. I can skip some. And uh, of course, I'll make these available afterwards. So, so I'm going to go through um, just a really, really brief history uh, and background. Uh, what are these things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera? And I'm going to talk a fair amount about machine learning and less about artificial intelligence. So the reason is the machine learning is what we often think of, is what's often uh, being applied when we think of these kinds of problems. And then we'll finally touch base, touch with uh, on biases and ethics. So I know it's really hard to see this slide, but um, the artificial intelligence, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence actually predates the word artificial intelligence by several decades. So even as early as the 1930s and 40s, people had the concept of an artificial intelligence just based on um, entertainment. So there were robots on TV uh, or on, on, on the radio or, um, or, or in live presentations or in books. Um, and uh, it was really not until the, early, or the mid 1950s that um, the word artificial intelligence uh, came about. There was a, a conference held in Dartmouth in 1956, which is kind of thought of as like the, the kickoff of modern artificial intelligence. There's a set of, there's a, a long string of funding that goes through the 1970s and early 80s. And then there's some quiet that happens in the late 70s through, the, through up to the 90s. And um, a lot of that has to do with what I'm gonna show next, the hype cycle. Who has seen or heard of the hype cycle before? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through it for a second because it applies in lots of different things, uh, lots of different uh, areas. So the hype cycle, this is time along the x-axis and visibility or interest along the y-axis. There's typically a technology trigger. What's the technology trigger for artificial intelligence? Well, back in the 1950s, it was an idea. In the 1970s, it was bigger computers. In the 1990s, it was the, um, the late 90s, it was big data and um, the, the um, advent of uh, graphical processing unit um, uh, technology that enabled a new round of, of artificial intelligence. So we're riding this last wave of artificial intelligence technology triggers. And believe it or not, um, we, a lot of things go through this. There's a peak of inflated expectations. Then, trough of disillusionment. This stuff doesn't work. And then finally, we hope that we end up on a slope of enlightenment to productivity. Bad news. Uh, this is from 2016, but it's probably still not too far off. Um, machine learning is at the top of the, uh, um, uh, the peak of interest, and we are very likely at some point, um, especially in medicine, uh, probably going to go through a trough of disillusionment. So what is artificial intelligence? I'm gonna put up some words and then I'll, then I'll uh, sort of put it all together. Um, artificial intelligence is the theory that, uh, the theory and development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, translation between languages. And you recognize that all of these are real. They're, 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 these are used in practice on your cell phone, um, and even in some research and, and even clinical settings. So machine learning, slightly different. It's the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. We give them data, they learn, or they, they generalize those data into rules that they use then to make predictions. It's seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a big thing. And then um, machine learning is a subset of that. And machine learning systems give the computer the ability to learn really without being explicitly programmed with rules. So the earliest artificial intelligence machine learning approaches were called expert systems. You could get everybody in the room, we ask you all hundreds of questions about how to diagnose kidney disease. We write down all the answers and then the computer now knows everything that you guys know. So we ask the computer a question about kidney disease and the computer can answer that based on your experience. But um, those rules are codified, they're written down, and they don't change over time. That's where machine learning is quite a bit different than it was at the time. 
we give it new data, it learns new, uh, learns new experience, and it can make better decisions, ideally. And then something that um, you might hear a, a little bit about, um, might hear the term uh, deep learning. It's, it's all the rage, and uh, it's part of this riding the te this technology trigger. Graphical processing units, the things that make your video games go really fast, turns out are really good at the computations required to do this deep learning. So um, deep learning that is um, machine learning or machine learning algorithms that are inspired by the structure and functions of the brain. Um, it's a subset of machine learning, and it's, that's a subset of artificial intelligence. And um, these uh, networks that we design um, and then train uh, have the ability to learn from learn particularly well from unstructured data. That's unstructured data now are text and images, whereas structured data are things like gene expression data. So how do these things relate? We've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, and they're sort of nested. Um, and in this uh, circle of deep learning, um, we, can we can substitute lots of different approaches. So deep learning is one approach or one uh, a way of, of uh, doing machine learning, you can put a lot of a lot of different uh, approaches in there. So um, there's a review from 2017. Uh, it's a, sorry, it's a little dated. Uh, that looks at applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare, and I don't think these have changed a lot. Um, uh, the, the colors are by year. The earliest year is 2013. Uh, so we're looking at diagnostic imaging. Genetics, uh, electro, uh, sorry, electrodiagnosis, um, mapping physiologics, uh, etc. And then finally, or then if we look at the the diseases in which these things are applied, uh, we have, and I, again, I don't think this has probably changed a lot. Uh, neoplasms, uh, nervous system diseases, cardiovascular, urogenital, pregnancy, digestive, respiratory, etc. So um, the, these, even as early as 2013, these were applied. Uh, the the x-axis here is uh, up, goes up to 3,000. So uh, even in 2013, we were looking at thousands of articles applying artificial intelligence in healthcare. Um, this little slide um, just is a reminder to me that um, we have sort of the things that are going on now and the things that are maybe going on in, in, in further down in the future. And um, you can see uh, prescribing or prescription um, uh, decision support, uh, simple risk calculations, prognostic scoring. Those are things that we do now uh, with computers. Um, and then we have some stuff that's uh, uh, also um, uh, being applied, uh, diagnostic support, tailored radiotherapy, uh, multifactorial risk prediction. Um, and then we have some things that are um, sort of off, uh, uh, off the scale, um, uh, further into the future than, than we are. Uh, autonomous ventilators, uh, AI insulin pumps, personalized drug protocols. And then an important detail is down here at the bottom. Uh, as we move from left to right, we move from reactive guidance to proactive intervention. So we're, we're seeing a patient, we look at a computer, it tells us something, we, we do something about it. Whereas in the future, that's gonna happen automatically. Uh, we have rule-based systems now, the things that I was talking about earlier. If you have a patient who comes in with, um, uh, with lung cancer and the nodule is larger than two centimeters and the patient is older than X and as a smoker, you do this. Whereas in the future, we're going to be taking these same kinds of systems and we're going to be um, uh, looking at all the data that we have available, and we're going to have those systems learn for themselves. If they make a mistake, they're going to be able to look back and see that they made that mistake and then correct themselves in the future. Uh, the, la the next row is manual update versus active learning. So manual update, uh, we get some new data, we retrain our model, uh, we redeploy our model, um, we retest it, we have to periodically do that. Whereas in the future, it'll, these things will be active. The, the system will be constantly learning from um, new data. And then finally, um, design behavior versus uh, monitoring or uh, monitor, monitoring activity. Um, 
rather than having to design every little detail of what we want our machine learning model to do, uh, there will be um, uh, active, ongoing, multifactorial, multi-axial um, monitoring that's going on to look at what's going on um, with a patient or with a system holistically rather than a specific asking a specific question. Switch gears a little bit. Any questions on that sort of overview? All right. So I'm going to uh, talk about this in a couple different or three different slides. I'm going to talk about it in a couple different ways because some people are comfortable with this idea and some people will be comfortable with the next slide. So machine learning comes in sort of um, three or four different flavors, depending on how you, how you, uh, who you ask. The, the most common though are unsupervised learning, which is this left box and supervised learning, the middle box. X is a, uh, are measurements. They're, they're so-called features or in supervised learning, we'd call them predictors. What are things? What are the thing, kinds of things that would be features or predictors? Lab values, for example, longitudinal lab values, um, the, the uh, brightness of pixels in a chest X-ray, um, et cetera. So X is are those things. Y, if we're talking about supervised learning, is what we want to predict. What we want to um, what we want to use our, our features to predict. And um, so sometimes we actually know what we want to predict. And sometimes we're not sure. We just have a bunch of data and we want to learn from it. Unsupervised learning is really great at looking at large amounts of data and trying to um, give it, so, show us patterns. Guess what? If you used unsupervised learning methods, will you find patterns? Yes, you will. The human eye is really good at picking out patterns and seeing things um, that may or may not be real. So even in unsupervised learning, we're going to come back to this, but you still need to, unsupervised learning is a hypothesis generating tool. It's not a, a good tool for testing hypotheses. Whereas supervised learning, um, we know what we want to learn. We can actually measure how well we learned it uh, by using, um, well, we'll come back to that. And then finally, some semi-supervised learning is a way of, um, and this, this may become more important over time, because we have to know why in order to do supervised learning, how do we get to know why? One of us usually sits around and reads a chart and says, this is true. This is the truth that I want to predict. With semi-supervised learning, we can do that with a small subset of the data. And then we can come back and use the computer to tell us what are the next most viable candidates that match our, that, uh, that have our truth value. We can look at those and we can then, re then iterate. So the idea is that we can start with smaller training sets, smaller training data, um, and uh, use those to expand to a larger set. Um, the quiz at the end is just to write this down. Uh, this is our, our map of machine learning. If you ever have any questions, you could just refer to this, this, uh, this map and it'll tell you exactly what to do, right? Not really. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to point out, I want to point out three, or, um, uh, the four blobs here. At the top, we have classification and regression. Those are supervised approaches. At the bottom, we have clustering and dimensionality reduction. So pretty much uh, all the applications of machine learning that you will see will fall into one of those categories. So we draw a line here. We've got supervised and unsupervised. And then at the top, we've got classification and regression in our supervised. What's the difference between classification and regression? Anybody? All right, I don't see enough coffee on the tables. So it's pretty simple. Classification, we have classes. We wanna talk about um, uh, patients who are going to get lung cancer versus those who are not. Regression, we're talking about a quantitative, a number. What's the risk of getting lung cancer? That's a number. So when we talk, when we have classes, we want to group uh, things into. We we have um, patients that we want to put into uh, uh, individual distinct groups. That's classification. When we want to uh, have a continuous variable associated with each patient. That's regression. And regression here doesn't necessarily mean linear regression. We'll come back to that. 
And then clustering versus dimensionality reduction, we'll go through that as well. Clustering is a way of grouping data that are similar. Dimensionality reduction is basically a way of taking um, very large um, amounts, uh, high dimensional data. What do I mean by high dimensional data? Chem 20 is 20 values. I want you to just look at the 20 values for 2000 patients and tell me what you see. No, we don't do that. We use dimensionality reduction to help us sort out what are the main features of those data. So I mentioned I'm gonna come back to supervised learning again. In supervised learning, on the left-hand side, we've got uh, blue dots and red dots. Why are they colored blue and red? Because they're true. Th those are our truth values. Those are, the, those are our Y values. And they're plotted like this because we've done some dimensionality reduction to put them onto a, a, a plot like this. And the goal of our, of our supervised learning method, whatever it is, is to come up with a model that we can apply that separates the groups and separates them most cleanly. In this case, we drew a line, but we could imagine uh, a, a different supervised learning approach that would draw a squiggly that would allow us to catch those two, block, two uh, uh, blue dots that ended up on the wrong side of the line. Uh, classification, it's a kind of interesting study. Uh, they looked at uh, chest X-rays, but they, uh, using deep learning, um, to predict uh, mechanical ventilation outcomes from pre-intubation uh, uh, x-rays from COVID-19 patients. And they used a really interesting technique called um, transfer learning. So they, uh, they, did their, they, they applied a model to about 250,000 chest x-rays to just learn all the different ways that chest x-rays vary. And um, for example, there's brightness, right? Um, some chest x-rays are brighter than others. Uh, some have, um, uh, some might have, um, uh, well, et cetera, you get the point. Um, so they take those features that they learned from this very large compendium of 250,000 x-rays and they apply, they looked at those features just in their 250 COVID-19 patients. And it turns out that they can predict pretty well um, uh, what the outcome of the of, uh, intubation uh, post-mechanical uh, ventilation is in these ICU patients. This is a, um, a regression um, uh, example. What we were doing here, this is from a paper that we published recently. Um, we were looking at, uh, 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 again, a, a kind of transfer learning. We took gene expression data from um, about uh, 500 or so uh, gene expression studies we looked at all the, the biological signals across all of those studies and then asked which biological signal looks closest or um, correlates strongest with neutrophil count, which we had in data set on the left. Then we applied that, uh, that same um, uh, biological signal to gene expression data for which we did not have neutrophil count. Turns out we can predict neutrophil count based on gene expression data. And we can do that now with lots of different biological signals because we looked at 500 different studies, um, just broad, <laughs> broadly, not cancer related or anything. Um, but the, the, what we're looking at here is a regression fit, right? We're asking how well do the data fit our model? So um, developing a, um, a supervised learning model uh, always starts with um, developing a question. If you don't have a clear question, then you can't develop a model that addresses that question. And oftentimes people will say, well, I have my data. Um, I want to apply machine learning to figure out what it is, what it means. Well, that's not a question, right? Um, so you need to sort of start to uh, tease out what are the things that you really care about your data? And it's not even obvious sometimes what your Y value, what, your, what you want to predict. Um, and sometimes you're constrained by the data that you have in hand. You collect data only after developing the question, ideally. Um, you split your data into training and test data. Why do we do that? Well, if we want to uh, uh, build a model that, uh, uh, that uh, encapsulates our data in some way, it allows us to predict uh, in some way, if we, um, we, can, we can then uh, ask how well did the model do? 
Well, if we ask how well did the model do on the same data that we trained on, then we have no idea what's going to happen when we get new data. And ideally, that's the, that's the reason we're developing these models. It's not always true in biology. Sometimes the model tells us what we want to know, but oftentimes we want to take it to new patients, new data. And so we have to either start with um, uh, two sets of data, or we have to create them artificially by splitting our original data into two sets. We estimate the models, uh, the model parameters. That is, we, we basically are training the model. And then finally, we test the model by calculating how well the model does on these new data. And uh, possibly validate the model. There's, there's some models that we require a third step. Um, what happens after this? Well, we talked about this at the beginning. We'd like to deploy the model. Deploying is we'd like to put it out in the wild and have it, on, have it work on real patients. How much time, energy, and money does it take to do that? There are probably people in the room who could tell me, um, for example, uh, the, the, the uh, fall risk model that's uh, used here, uh, how, how long it took to put that into place, but it was probably months to maybe a year, um, and who knows how many man hours to do it. So deploying models is a very heavy lift um, and, and very onerous. So. Just going to uh, walk through now quickly um, some algorithms for supervised learning. What's this one? I, I think I hear somebody mumbling regression somewhere back there, maybe even whispering. I can't hear whispers, but this is a linear regression, right? So linear regression is often um, an overlooked uh, machine learning model. It's really, really good at uh, at, at uh, uh, as a machine learning model, one, because it's simple, two, because it's quite interpretable, and three, because it's actually pretty robust. That is, it works in lots of situations, even when things are not quite linear. For the statisticians in the room, what's this? Probably no statisticians in the room, sorry. This is so-called Anscombe's Quartet. All of these, all of these points, or all of these models here, have the same R squared, have the same correlation coefficient as all the others. So the point here is with Anscombe created this uh, to one, convince us all that we need to look at our data before we apply machine learning models. And two, after we get a machine learning model to make sure that we go back and make sure that the machine learning model makes sense. Because you can tell from, for example, the, the one in the right upper right-hand corner, we could probably come up with a better machine learning model than a linear fit through what looks like uh, a parabola. So um, if things are linear and not very complicated, linear regression look, works pretty well. If things get more complicated, nonlinear, the, the uh, variables um, are, are maybe categorical, um, then we might wanna think about other approaches. This is a, a regression or a classification tree um, it's a classification tree because we have survived and died. We can use the same tree approach to do regression as well. And what would we do there? We would, instead of being, instead of predicting died or survived, we'd be predicting, for example, um, what the patient's creatinine is. Um, if we have very few variables, very few predictors, then maybe one tree, and, and we see these in, 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 our, um, in our algorithms all the time, right? One tree might be enough. But if we have tens of thousands of variables, then you can imagine that lots of trees might have very similar prediction capabilities. And if we have now uh, lots of nonlinearity, lots of relationships between our variables, then we might need to be able to account for that in our models. And if we had only one tree, um, to do that with, we might get stuck. So let me come, come back to that in a second. So there's this idea of uh, this other approach called random forests, which basically makes a bunch of these trees, thousands of them. And at each, for each tree, it's, uh, it takes a subset, a random subset of the data, predict, it builds a tree for that random subset, moves on to the next random subset, moves on to the next random subset. And then what do we do at the end? Well, we have a thousand trees. Each of them is the equivalent of this. So if we put in new data at the top, 
will end up in one of these leaves at the bottom that tells us whether the patient survived or died. We do that a thousand times. And let's say that 600 of them said, say the patient died. Well, now we have our, our prediction. It's 600 out of a thousand. So we have 60% chance based on our random forest model that um, this is true or that, that that's the prediction. So random forests are really good at um, these very high dimensional data sets where there are a lot of interrelationships between, um, uh, between variables, um, but they have sort of the same interpretability as, uh, or similar interpretability to one of these trees. Um, another one that's uh, may, maybe you've heard of, K nearest neighbor. Basically we're gonna uh, plot the data in, well, we don't even need to plot them. We have high dimensional data. We have another, we bring in another sample. We just look and see in our high dimensional data set, which in this case, uh, three, K equals three, which three um, uh, samples that we know the truth of are closest. In this case, we're, we're close to two blues and one orange. We vote and the new sample, the green one is a blue. We can change the K, right? We can go to larger numbers of K, smaller numbers of K. Um, but K nearest neighbor, turns out it's very fast, which is why people, one of the reasons people like it. Um, uh, but it, it actually works again, pretty well. And again, you can see it's pretty non-linear, right? Um, you can have these, the blues and the oranges all intermingled and K nearest neighbor could potentially still find the, um, a, a closest um, true result. Um, I'll just mention uh, deep learning. This is uh, what uh, one example of a neural network would look like. Um, we've got our X's, our inputs, our Y's, our outputs. Each of these um, uh, circles is a so-called neuron. And that neuron is pretty, it's a very simple thing. It basically takes its inputs and decides, do I fire or not? There are lots of ways of coding these, in, these neurons, but it's, it's a very simple concept. If I, get, if I get enough input from upstream, then I fire. And if I don't, then I don't. Each of these connections is a so-called weight. So the output of this goes into each of, in this case, goes into each of the neurons that's connected. And these weights then are what we actually train in our model. So we have the computer, we can now see there's, I don't know how many, how many weights there are. Somebody can do the math. There are a lot of weights here. And this is a tiny model. The largest models are trillions of, of parameters right now. Um, so we need to figure out what these weights are. That becomes our trained model. And then new data comes in, the neurons fire based on the inputs all the way across and we get our output. So I, I know that's a, that's, that's a hand wavy um, uh, uh, description, but that's kind of how it works. It's, um, and the, like I said, these, these neurons are very, very simple. It's um, the combination of weights going across and the way that we put the, the layers together that um, gives us more specificity, I guess, in the model. Um, if anybody wants to uh, learn more about um, uh, opportunities, obstacles for deep learning in biology and medicine, um, Casey Green uh, has put together this uh, crowdsourced article. It's only 48 pages long when it only has 555 citations. So it's easy, easy reading tonight, um, but seriously, it's actually a, a quite, quite a good article. Um, and they're continuing to work on it, update it, um, even though it's been published. For those who wanna think about applying machine learning, um, it's actually not terribly difficult to apply it in real life. Um, this is a, an algorithm, or this is a schematic of um, a package uh, for the R statistical programming language called MLR3 um, that allows you to apply these machine learning models. I can tell you, I, I teach this in an afternoon, um, teach the application of it in an afternoon to people. It's not terribly hard to actually apply it. To understand what's going on it may take a little bit longer, but you can do these things. Switching gears to unsupervised learning. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip through a lot of this, but the, the idea here is that on the left-hand side, we have our group of points again, they're unlabeled. They don't have colors. Um, 
why don't it have colors? Because we don't know what the true value, we don't, we don't know what, we don't know, maybe we don't know what we're supposed to be predicting, or more, more likely, we don't know what, uh, which samples belong to which categories. So we're gonna apply some unsupervised learning approach. We're gonna shift over to the right. And, and uh, let's say that our machine learning approach is, decides that there are two sort of distinct groups. What do you do at that point? Well, if you don't know more about the data on the left, you go, I don't know, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. What you hope though, is that there's some piece of data attached to your samples that allows you to understand why there are two groups. That becomes a hypothesis then that you could test either in a laboratory or by getting new patients or by doing different sets of assays on the same patients. Um, so unsupervised learning, again, it's a, 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 an approach for developing hypotheses, but we still need to, once we uh, find something, a pattern that we recognize, or that we think we recognize, we still have to prove it to ourselves. Talk a teeny bit about clustering. What is this? What is this mess? This is gene expression data. Genes in the rows, samples in the columns. I don't know how many samples we have there, 10. Um, and I've highlighted two columns uh, in red. I'm not, so we've been talking about high dimensional data and I've been sort of waving my hands about it. Let's look at what high dimensional data look like. Two samples, how can we decide whether they're similar or different from each other? Each one has say 20,000 genes, 20,000. So 20,000 genes, it's a 20,000 dimensional space. How do we measure relationships in 20,000 dimensional space? It's not that hard. This is a scatter plot of those two, those two samples, right? So what can you tell me by looking at the scatter plot? Is it totally random? Are these, are these samples totally unrelated to each other? No, they're related in somehow in some way, right? Because there's some kind of might call it correlation, right? So one way that we could talk about how these samples are similar or different is by using correlation. Right. Another way we won't talk about it in more detail is, is say Euclidean distance. There are lots of other ways of measuring distance in high dimensional space. But if you keep this in mind, that this is this is what we're looking at when we're talking about high dimensional space. We can take two two samples and we can look at them and see how similar they are, or how different they are from each other. So clustering. Then uh, we're going to think about samples rather than genes, but um, we've got our genes on the, or our samples on the right, and we're going to just ask how similar are uh, the genes to or each of the pairs of genes to each other. And let's say that gene four and gene five are the most similar. We're going to connect them, and this is going to become the first arm of our cluster. We're going to ask the question again and again and again, and we're finally going to build up to the point that we have our hierarchical clustering. And we can uh, define the clusters however we see fit. There's no sort of right or wrong answer as to how many clusters are, are here. We can cut at the bottom, we can cut at the top, we can have between two and uh, uh, let's see, n minus one uh, clusters. So that's essentially what all clustering is, is looking at these relationships between each of the two samples or genes and connecting them based on their correlation or their distance between each other. Dimensionality reduction is a little bit different. So what we're looking at on the right-hand side is um, a set of uh, cancers. They're colored by, uh, by type. So the orange is um, uh, breast cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, et cetera, on the way down, long way down. This is uh, two dimensions. How do we get from 20,000 dimensions to two dimensions? Come back here. In this case, um, we use something called principal components analysis. This is in two dimensions what principal components analysis looks like. But the idea is that if we have, um, uh, well, in two dimensions, we're going to look for the, the arrow that points in the direction of the largest amount of variability. In 20,000 dimensions, we're going to look for the arrow that points in the largest amount of variability. It's just 20,000 dimensions rather than two. 
That's going to become our first principal component, principal component. And then each of the samples will get a value based on drawing a line from the sample back to the line of the principal component. That becomes our, those are our loadings then. And so when we, when we do that, when we go through that process, um, we can get uh, as many principal, the number, of principal, the number of samples minus one principal components. But principal components are really special in that they, the first principal component is always, always um, uh, defined, calculated to have the most variance associated with it. So what, we, what we'd like to do is to be able to summarize our 20,000 dimensional space our, our biological signal in our 20,000 dimensional space by a very small set of principal components. And if we plot those, uh, for example, let's see, um, we've got prostate cancer on the left, and then we've got these three other cancer types on the right. Somebody can probably tell me, who will probably come up with a biological hypothesis of why prostate cancer is on the left and the other, sam the other samples are on the right. But whatever that biological reason is, if there, if there is a biological reason, it's encapsulated in principal component one. And the same thing with principal component two, there's the colorectal cancer at the bottom, uh, breast cancer at the top with non small cell lung cancer in the middle. Whatever biological signal causes that is encapsulated in principal component two. Does this usually work this way? No. This is a, a study from the early 2000s. Um, this is an easy study to do, an easy study to analyze. Things don't work this way in real life. So machine learning review. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff, um, but I, I just want you to keep in mind that when you talk, people talk to you about machine learning, it's pretty simple. We're talking about supervised learning or unsupervised learning. We're talking about supervised learning. We're talking about classification. We have classes, distinct groups of samples. Regression, we have a continuous variable that we're trying to predict. Unsupervised learning, we don't know what we're trying to predict. We're trying to learn from our data and develop hypotheses. And we can do that using clustering or dimensionality reduction. Um, so that's kind of like, this is the take home slide. Um, there are a lot of resources here for those, those folks who want to try some of this stuff. I have some hands-on tutorials that I do with, with uh, people. There's some blogs. Um, uh, there's a couple of um, uh, reviews, um, and again, when I share the slides, be, these will be hot linkable. Ethics and AI and ML. I think I'm going to stop with this slide. Um, we we often don't know. We we often uh, get really bogged down, especially when we're talking about biology. In what are the ethics and moral and concerns? Let's make it really simple. We've got a self-driving car. What do we want the self-driving car to do? Well, we want it to miss kids on the street, right? We want it to not crash into, crash into trees or other cars. What about a turtle crossing the road? What do we want the, 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 uh, the self-driving car to do with a turtle crossing the road? It's a simple question, right? But imagine trying to train an artificial intelligence to not only um, avoid that thing or, or to you know, knowing that avoiding it might mean crashing into another car uh, or go straight over it, we have to teach it, you know, sort of the concept of what's a, what's a living thing versus a dead thing. Um, you know, what what is the value? So uh, it's a very simple model, but it helps us to think a little bit about the kinds of things that we can get stuck in when we start to think about deploying artificial intelligence at scale um, for a healthcare system. Um, there's some good stuff about biases and AI and ML, um, how you can divide it up and how you can begin to address it in different pieces. Um, I will, I'll, I'll say that um, the basically um, biases can come from data themselves, they can come from the algorithm, or they can come from humans. And are those ever distinct from each other? Not really. Um, but uh, there's a lot of effort now at NIH um, through NIH funding, and of course, anybody who's thinking about this in developing models that are uh, not only unbiased, but um, equitable. Um, so, uh, and uh, we want our, we may actually want some bias if we want to drive toward equi equitable outcomes for a certain uh, subset of patients. So it's, it's a very com complicated set of questions. And that's why I say deploying models 
is a long stretch from, I've got a model that predicts this perfectly. So I'll stop there. Questions, comments, concerns? Oh. Are you going? For those at home, we're just getting a, mi a microphone. Uh, questions for Dr. Davis from the audience. If not, I have, oh, I'm back here. Amran? Thank you for the talk. Sure. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one is, in what form do you think um, machine learning and artificial intelligence should be baked into medical education where, when, um, looking ahead 10, 15, 20 years from now, we'll be probably dealing with uh, algorithm outputs and we have to contend with what to do. And uh, so just wanted to get your thoughts if there's some work done in creating more educational curricula um, around there. And the second is unrelated to that, um, has to do with, I talked about labeling. And one of the examples you brought in was the x-rays to predict um, the ventilation outcomes, patients who are not ventilated yet. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the baked into the assumption there is that the, whoever got ventilated was an appropriate decision. And when there's a variation in decisions who to ventilate, early in the pandemic, we ventilated more than later in, in pandemic. Um, how does that affect them? Uh, the output. So if people with less severe x-rays got ventilated early on and, and, and that changed later on, but the machine is using the totality of the data to give one prediction, how do you get around those issues? But in general, whenever the labeling involves human error and variability in decision-making, uh, what's that process like to sort of unpack that? Yeah. Um, in terms of, for the first question, medical education, I'm hoping that this is a start. Um, I didn't mention it, but uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a new department of biomedical informatics uh, that was just formed. Um, we have, we pulled in faculty from um, the um, Department of Medicine, um, Bioinformatics and Precision Medicine uh, Division has become part of the, the department and um, the section for clinical uh, informatics at, uh, in, at, in pediatrics has come over as well. So we have 25 faculty um, uh, who, started on day one. Uh, myself and Casey Green uh, are the outsiders. Uh, uh, Melissa Andel was also hired as well. Um, so the hope is that over time, we're going to infiltrate medical education um, more readily uh, as we get more bodies um, focused on these kinds of efforts. In terms of labeling, um, uh, there's, there's sort of two, at least two things in there. One is um, the human error in labeling. So what, what uh, people typically try to do when they're developing these, these models is develop a ground truth. So um, if there's uh, a lot of variability in, in humans uh, in the way that they label, then they might have a panel of three or four experts do the labeling. There's a, a second implication in what you asked, which is what happens if the, if the, uh, um, uh, if the environment, if the, the, um, if the sampling changes over time? Um, the sampling here being the patients who are intubated. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, any deployment in clinical intelligence, um, clinical decision support has to begin to address is um, how do I uh, see model drift? What happens? How do I see when the model is not doing as well as it was at the beginning? So you have to sort of constantly reevaluate, you have to reevaluate it on a regular basis, ideally constantly. And in the most ideal situation, your model is adjusting. It's learning as you go along. Um, so, when, so when you're looking at a patient today, it's comparing to a patient close to today rather than a patient at the beginning of the pandemic. So all of those things are things that um, uh, UC Health thinks about very seriously. Um, they have a clinical intelligence working group that um, looks at these models, evaluates them, puts them into practice, and then continuously gets updates. Um, uh, in both real time in the in the office, but also in um, uh, inter intervals. So, Brian. Hi, thank you, Sean. Brian Haugen from Endocrinology. Um, this is really 
fascinating. And I, I guess I was thinking a little bit about the over many years, many of us have been parts of guidelines. Yeah. And, and the guidelines have taken years to develop. And by the time they're put out there, they're already obsolete. Um, and how do you see this type of, whether it be machine learning, deep learning, helping the experts or itself becoming an expert to have, an, like you talk about, what you'd love to do is have it iteratively, you know, getting updated uh, very rapidly. What, what's your vision of that in, in what we do in general guidelines? I'm not, not, you know, what we may be doing 10, 15 years from now, if this, you know, can do its work. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things kind of wrapped up in that. Um, and it's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that we could actually help quite a lot with, uh, with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is just figuring out how to get those, the, those, the guidance in to the right patient and the right physician at the right time. Um, so we don't have to figure out what the guidance is. We just have to make sure that it gets there. This, you pointed it out. Um, oftentimes, guidance is is um, is put out in a journal. It might take a decade or maybe even two before it's in in relative in uh, regular clinical practice. So I think one of the things that we can do is to use artificial intelligence to try to um, drive uh, those guidelines, the the impl in, in the um, implementation of those guidelines more quickly, um, more readily, um, and with less um, uh, le less onerous for clinicians, because how many guidelines are you supposed to be following? Um, the second, I guess, it's probably closer to, to your, what your question is, um, how do we, uh, how do we uh, sort of automate or develop smarter, um, more data-driven guidelines uh, without as much expert um, opinion, um, without as much um, committee time. And I, I think that um, that's part of uh, what UC Health wants to do um, is to uh, partner with folks on campus uh, who, who do research um, to uh, uh, look at the available data, look at the, um, the clinical and business operations questions, um, and then try to develop models and take them all the way through to deployment. Um, as I mentioned, those, that's expensive. Um, it's very onerous and time consuming. So we have to prioritize um, and recognize that we won't be able to, to do that with too many things at the beginning, but that's the goal. That's part of one of the goals of the uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics is to become a really good partner with UC Health. In the bigger picture, we don't have national health care in the United States. There are very few situations where we have a national level um, repository of data. Um, the, the cancer repositories are, are sort of close to that. Uh, we have the National COVID Consortium, which was um, very much uh, um, anchored here, uh, which is a compendium of uh, basically all the patients who went through CTSAs um, uh, in the United States, so 70 or so contributing institutions, all putting their patient data into a single database um, that everyone can learn from. Those kinds of things, if they become more commonplace, um, make it a lot easier to do exactly what you're saying which is to develop these models, test them quickly, and then potentially even deploy them, um, ideally with partners who know how to um, monitor them over time. I hope that answers your question. Okay, cool. A couple online questions. I had, I had one myself before we go to the online questions. And it's about the concept you talked about, about bias within the data. And we think about you know, how we use race and ethnicity and other things in large data sets. Is there any thought that machine learning could be, should be, or will be better than humans. You know, I know that the early computer phraseology was garbage in, garbage out, right? Your results couldn't be any better than your data. Can machines do better? Can they find the garbage? Um, uh, you're talking about in terms of the bias or just in general? In terms of the bias. Um, so people are looking at that, yeah, to look for, to uh, look in um, basically sort of what we might call the, the equivalent of unsupervised approaches, looking for bias. Um, uh, I would say that those are research areas. I'm not an expert. Um, so I would say that that's an area of active research. Um, I would say where a lot of the focus is right now is really on, um, uh, we, we talk about it in terms of AI and ML, but it's, it's really a, a large scale research process problem that we have in the United States where we don't engage patients. Um, forget the bias for a second. We don't engage patients necessarily in, in research. We enroll them in studies, but 
then they sort of go off and um, do their thing. And five to 10 years later, when we get the results, it'd be great if they were engaged along the, along the way and thinking about how this might impact them, psychosocial impact. But um, uh, that really, it comes down to um, thinking about bias from start to finish. The, the, the uh, machine learning model is one area that you can focus on, but um, also, also the data to collection, um, the, the um, interventions uh, that might come about because of it, um, all of those things become part of a process, I guess. And that's a, it's, it's really the distinction between biomedical informatics um, and this thing that we've been talking about machine learning. Biomedical informatics is not just the technology, but it's also how the system works, how the people work, uh, how the costs come out. Um, is there a cost benefit? Or is there a cost or a benefit? Um, all of that becomes wrapped up in biomedical informatics. So it's, it, I'm not really answering your question other than to say that it's complex and we can address it at multiple different points along the way. So. Thanks. I just had one last yeah. quick question. I'm Meryl Colton. I'm one of the chief residents. Um, and as someone who's thinking about taking their next step in their training, you've been a clinician and a biostatistician. Um, and these things don't exist without each other, right? Sort of the pitfalls a lot of these methods are that they're really hard to interpret at the end if you don't have clinical context. Meanwhile, us residents are sitting here, you know, deep in all this data that we think could be really interesting, but we don't have the time to learn these statistical tools always. How do you see sort of the optimal collaboration between clinician and statistician so that we can take these to the next step? Um, that's a great question. Um, and there's a continuum, I think. Um, the, the thing that clinicians can do better than anyone is ask good questions. So, um, you know, some clinic, so, so I teach this course at Cold Spring Harbor. We have, you know, a few cl clinicians every year, mostly it's basic scientists, but we have a few cl clinicians every year. We had a couple this year who came with the expl explicit um, goal of not learning how to do this, but learning the, um, uh, how to think, how to, how to um, translate their questions into um, quantitative science. And, and so that's something that I think um, a lot of us could, can get to um, is, you know, listening to lectures like this, potentially some short courses um, where you can uh, learn a little bit about how these technologies work, how these, um, some of the pitfalls, um, how to read an article, um, and, and how to make sure that it addresses the questions that you want. But really clinicians are, are exquisitely good at asking questions. Um, in, in terms of um, uh, the continuum, there are clinicians who, uh, who do have set aside research time. You do have to set, have set aside research time um, who, who do look at their data. Um, and you could imagine, I, I mean, I explained to, that I can teach someone to do a principal components analysis in a couple hours. Does that mean that you're an expert in principal components analysis? No, but it means that you can take a large data set and potentially do something with it, um, begin to ask some questions, develop some hypotheses that then you can take to your biostatistician friend. Um, but uh, collaboration is, is um, I, I wish I had a, a good answer for like what the right recipe is, but um, open communication is, is really key. Um, this email back and forth, not a good answer. So get a meeting. It just takes time, but uh, but it's worth it's worth FaceTime. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think I just want to ask one last question. In terms of um, early AI and, and ML that we've heard of, like Watson and the Human Diagnosis Project, have they fulfilled their potential, or are they on their path to fulfilling a potential that that people would recognize? Um, and Watson, uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, that's for, for those of you who don't know, Watson was a, a multi tens of millions of dollars effort by IBM with some, some cancer center partners to develop a system for um, uh, diagnosing and um, uh, uh, treating patients. It, it was, I think, I, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I don't think anybody would. It was a disaster. Um, and, and there are lots of reasons, lots of rationales for why that's the case. But a lot of it came down to they didn't, know, they didn't ask a good question. They had a bunch of data. They were presented with a bunch of data and said, learn from it. And that's exactly how not to do artificial intelligence and machine learning. You really want to focus in on those questions. They may be small questions to begin with, but in many cases, the small questions are the clinically relevant ones. You know, how do we get this? 
this uh, guidance into the right patient to the right patient at the right time, we know that this will work. Um, so it's it's often not these complex models; it's the simple ones that uh, have real clinical impact that are the most most valuable. Watson was not an example of that. So yeah. Fair enough. Okay, it's one o'clock, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all.